Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Patrick Tui. I'm the Director of Municipal Policy at the Show Me Institute. And uh, tonight's uh, presentation is a little bit different than what we've done in the past. Oftentimes, we have uh, presentations when we have reached the end of a research project. But this evening indicates really the beginning of the Show Me Institute's uh, uh, work on criminal justice reform. And so we're very honored to have you here and have our participants uh, talk to us tonight. Uh, again, thank you to each of our panelists. Um, in a few moments, I'll introduce each member. Uh, after our introductions, each panelist will have about seven minutes to speak to you about their background, their experience in criminal justice, uh, and what reforms they think would make for better public policy. Uh, after that, I'll have a few questions for them, and then my colleague, uh, Emily Staley, has a microphone, and uh, she'll be going around. If you have questions, just raise your hand, and we'll get some questions and some back and forth uh, towards the end. Uh, so starting at the far end, uh, Barry Langford is the chair of the Columbia College Criminal Justice Program, our host tonight, and he's been teaching here since 1994. Next to him is Aaron Headland, an economics professor at the University of Missouri and a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Uh, Nicole Volkert in the middle has over a decade of criminal court experience She's served both Monroe and Montgomery counties as head prosecutor and has also been a municipal judge. Uh, Jennifer Bukowski is a criminal defense attorney with over 10 years experience. She founded the Bukowski Law Firm seven years ago after serving as a public defender for three years. Uh, and last but not least, we have Treasurer Schmidt, the treasurer of the state of Missouri, elected in 2016. And uh, uh, Treasurer Schmidt will tell us about his background in the legislature and kind of what the view of criminal justice reform is from Jeff City. So if you'll join me in Mike, welcoming everybody. And Barry. Thank you very much. I've been asked primarily to, dis to uh, discuss punishment theory and then some uh, possible reforms that have already been undertaken in other places and uh, some things maybe that we could do in the state of Missouri. Uh, there's five generally accepted purposes of punishment according to criminologists. Uh, incapacitation or restraint, meaning uh, if somebody's convicted of a crime, they need to be isolated or confined until they're no longer a danger. Uh, retribution, which means that a sentence ought to be perceived as harsh enough that there's not a desire for victim or community vengeance after it's served. Uh, reformation or rehabilitation, which means that prisons should and can uh, reform people so that they can succeed uh, when they get back on the outside. And then two forms of deterrence, general deterrence, which applies to the general public, and specific deterrence, which applies to specific individuals who have already served a sentence. The idea of each deterrence is that uh, because there are consequences to violating the law, people will make a rational choice not to violate the law again, particularly if they've already served a sentence. How do these purposes of punishment <clears throat> relate to calls for criminal justice reform around the country? Well, first of all, for incapacitation or restraint, many people argue that we are now restraining uh, too many people uh, for too long a time for the wrong things at the expense of uh, other more important priorities such as uh, health care and roads and uh, education. Retribution. Most would agree that retribution is appropriate for harsh or mala in se crimes, but many people are incarcerated for less serious or mala prohibitive crimes, and is retribution really appropriate for that sort of an offense? Uh, ideally, reformation and rehabilitation can and does take place in the prison system, but prisons around the country are stressed in terms of their employment numbers. It is hard for them to fill vacancies. Uh, many programs have been cut, and they're certainly not doing as good a job at reforming and rehabilitating as they used to. Uh, and then general deterrence and specific deterrence. Does the law and does severe sanctions in the law have a general deterrent effect? Certainly it does for a few, but for not, perhaps not for a majority simply because many members of the public don't know the specific consequences for violating a particular criminal law. 
uh, just as they do not know who their congressmen, senators, uh, state legislators, state representatives are, et cetera. What about specific deterrence? Does serving a severe sentence deter the same offender from reoffending once they are released? Seems to intuitively make sense. But many times, uh, serving a harsh sentence does not deter the individual from reoffending when they are released. Uh, individuals can be schooled to a criminal lifestyle while in prison. Okay? Additionally, serving a long sentence can isolate people from their social networks and uh, their, uh, their, their economic uh, connections, and it's tough for them to make it when they get back on the outside world. What are some specific reforms that Missouri could do? And I, I've mentioned a couple of specific things here that have been done in other states. First one is California Prop 47. This was an initiative proposal that was voted in by California voters in the, in the 2014 election. And that proposition reclassified a lot of low-grade felonies into misdemeanors. Uh, the felonies suggested were uh, possession of drugs, stealing, forgery, credit card fraud, uh, passing bad check, property type crimes. Uh, the law also allowed for resentencing of individuals who had already been convicted uh, under that offense. It impacted potentially one million Californians you know, who, who either were being prosecuted or had already been convicted for these laws. They've tracked a lot of the cost savings uh, under that law. They, they have a specific clause in the law that transfers the cost savings into the schools and for uh, other reform programs. They're still testing the public safety impacts, but uh, that's a type of comprehensive approach that you know, could be tried theoretically in Missouri or other states. Additionally, there's a program out of Hawaii that's gotten a lot of attention in the national press. It's known as the, the acronym is HOPE. Hawaii Opportunity Probation Enforcement. It's a pretty intensive form of probation uh, that allows for regular, frequent contact between judges and probation officer and the person on probation. And the, upon the first violation, if it's a minor one, the individual is brought before a judge promptly and sentenced to a very short jail sentence and then given a second chance. And in some cases, a third chance. This program has been successful uh, in other states. It's been copied in 12 other states. I think there may be some Missouri circuits that have tried similar things, but this is an example of a specific pro program that's been tried elsewhere. I've also linked, there's a, uh, an organization known as the National Criminal Justice Association that has developed an awards program for innovative programs. and. Uh, there's other examples of programs that have been tried successfully and received awards in other states. What about long-term goals? <clears throat> the first is, and it relates back to deterrence, emphasizing policies that further certainty and swiftness of apprehension and processing as opposed to severity of sentence. Uh, that's one of the main determinants of the effectiveness of a deterrent is whether the punishment is certain and swift as opposed to severe. Uh, that's one of the reasons that the HOPE program has worked uh, so well. Uh, also, reclassification of activity, decriminalization of certain activity, reducing offenses from felony to misdemeanor, uh, expanded use of prison alternatives and divert, diverted uh, prosecution, reducing length of sentence and probation and parole period, and then reducing corrections expenditures as a share of the overall state budget. Probably in the last 30 years or so, some of the other panelists may touch on this, but correction spending has probably gone up by 2 or 3% as a share of the overall state budget. So perhaps a goal could be to get it headed back in the other direction. Thank you. All right, so I approach this issue a little bit differently. I don't have a long background as a criminal justice expert. I approach this as an economist. And what that means in particular is two things. One is trying to separate 
mere correlation from actual cause and effect. And the second thing is to look at the incentives. When we set up the criminal justice system in a particular way, how does that affect people's behavior? And then how does that behavior translate into different outcomes in terms of crime and cost? So I wanted to start by talking about some different trends, right, just so we can get on the same page. So first of all, since 1980, what you can see is that we have far more people incarcerated in prison now than we did back then. And th that's true in percentage terms, whether you're looking at the federal jail, federal prison or state prison or local jails. But in terms of absolute number, that's primarily among local and state. Uh, and right now, we basically have one out of every 28 kids has a parent that is in jail. Right, so this is not something that just affects a fringe part of society. This affects a lot of people. And correction spending is up 300%. It's now $80 billion. Uh, here in Missouri, we spend you know, $20,000 per prisoner. So it's, this is a, a big expenditure, and there are a lot more people in jail. Uh, the question is, why is that? Because what's interesting is actually since 1980, the crime rate has fallen. So it's not that we have more people committing crime. That's not the cause. And I, I have a little decomposition here. Right, so the incarcerations per population, it either has to come from more crimes per person, more arrests per crime, or more imprisonments per arrest. Well, we have fewer crimes per person now, so that's actually going down, and arrests per crime has been pretty flat since the early 80s. So the reason we have far more people in jail is because more people are getting sentenced to jail after getting arrested than they used to be. Right, you can see that in the graphs right there. And just to put some numbers to that, uh, you can look at the murder rate. Right? In 1984, you only had 7.9 crimes. Sorry, you had 7.9 crimes per 100,000 people. That is now down to five. Uh, you can look at rape. That has fallen. You can look at robbery. That has fallen. But then if you go to the, the three columns on the right, that's prison admissions per arrest. And you can see, especially with murder, for example, that went from 0.59 to 1.15. Right, that's nearly a doubling in the prison admission rate per arrest. Right, that's what's driving up uh, the, the prison population. Uh, if you look at drugs, of course, that is one area where arrests really have gone up a lot. Right? And unfortunately, there's been actually kind of a, a misconception out there that all of criminal justice issues in terms of more people going to jail are due to drugs. And so the question is, how much is actually because of the war on drugs? Well, it is true that there are more arrests because of drugs. Uh, but even now, less than 20% of, of drug felonies are really people going to prison because of drugs. Uh, so it's not all drugs. In fact, 51% of the people are going because of violent offenses. Uh, and if you think about sentence length, you know, we've heard how people are serving longer and longer sentences. Well, if you look at the, the, at the median person in jail, that actually hasn't changed so much. And that includes people who have committed drug offenses. That has not changed a lot. What's happened, though, is that some people, particularly violent offenders, are getting much longer sentences than they used to be getting. Now, what about Missouri specifically? Well, unfortunately, we have the, the dubious distinction of, of leading the, the Midwest in incarceration growth uh, from the early 70s to 2000. And uh, we have the, the eighth highest incarceration rate. And despite that, we actually have above average crime. I guess the one thing that's on our side is, despite the fact that we spend a lot, we do, in fact, spend a little bit less than average uh, per prisoner. So the question is, what is the goal? Right? When we're thinking about the criminal justice system, how should we think about it? And so this diagram here has got a bunch of circles and, and arrows. It basically is, is a kind of a flow diagram of showing how people go from different stages. Right? So most of us, hopefully, would be in the non-criminals category. Right, but then you've got criminals who are actively engaged in crime. You've got people who are currently in the criminal justice system, like the courts, and then people who are actually in prison. So when we think about criminal justice, what we really want to do is we want to shrink the size of criminals. Right? We don't want as many criminals out there committing crimes. But we also want to do that being aware of the cost of the actual criminal justice system. Right? We've heard for years about being tough on crime. Absolutely. But we should also be tough on criminal justice spending and we should be smart on how we do things. So in particular, when we think about this flow chart, we should think about one of those arrows, like going from non-criminals to criminals. How do we reduce that flow? Well, that's deterrence. And one theory that we've had in the criminal justice system over the past few de decades is that if we have harsher and harsher penalties, fewer people will go from non-criminal to criminal because they'll be deterred from that activity. Well, economic research suggests that that's not actually very accurate. What's more effective is a very 
high likelihood, as Barry just mentioned, a very high likelihood of getting caught rather than a very long sentence. Uh, and unfortunately, we also have things that after you leave prison, there are all sorts of artificial barriers that we have set up that prevent people from getting jobs and housing and other economic opportunities. Some of those things make sense. We don't want you know, violent sex offenders being near kids. Uh, but on the other hand, there are hundreds of these things that make no sense whatsoever. And unfortunately, what they do is they reduce economic opportunities for ex-prisoners and make it more likely for them to commit crimes. Uh, so I'll just kind of briefly talk about the, the kind of four areas we can hit when it comes to reform, and then we'll get to more details later. Uh, so first of all, there, there's really four broad areas that I would suggest for reform. Uh, first is to stop over-criminalization. And over-criminalization, let me just show you a, a nice graph here. This has nothing to do with more people committing crimes. This is about us defining more and more activities as being a crime. Right, so when you think of a crime, you might think of murder or robbery, which are kind of obvious, but there are actually thousands of crimes that you have no idea that they're even a crime. And we have people who are getting punished and going to jail for things that, in their mind, they're, they're doing completely innocently. So we need to, first of all, stop the proliferation of activities that really should not be, have criminal penalties associated with them. And number two, protect people and their rights for when they do accidentally you know, incur an infraction. Uh, secondly, when it comes to uh, sentencing, we, it should be less one-size-fits-all. Right? We, we should not be determining sentencing policy, such as mandatory minimums and things like that, based purely on you know, being angry at criminals and wanting to you know, be mad at them. Right? What we need to do is to think about what is actually effective, what is actually stopping them from committing crimes, and what is also you know, going to basically be cost-effective for us to achieving our goals. Third is this whole economic consequence thing I talked about, which is that when you leave prison, the goal should be getting you to be a productive citizen again. Well, it's awfully hard to be a productive citizen if you can't find a place to live and you can't get a job, and in some cases you can't drive. Right? Those are things that are artificial barriers and uh, basically reduce deterrence. And, and by the way, as a little aside, one thing that's oftentimes talked about is ban the box. We can talk about that during Q&A. Ban the box is actually not a very effective way of increasing employment. Uh, it's something that, as a side effect, actually causes increased uh, discrimination. And then lastly, we need to better align monetary incentives. Right? When you think about, there is not one criminal justice system. There's local, there's state, there's federal. And unfortunately, as things are currently set up, there's a lot of free riding. So you might have a locality which, in their minds, they see a criminal as a pure nuisance, and to them, there's zero cost to just shuttling them off to the state prison. Well, that costs all of us a lot, both in terms of money and other things. And we need to align the monetary incentives so that people are making wise decisions on, on criminal justice policies. So we can talk about more details when we get to the Q&A. Thank you. So I have been an attorney for almost 20 years and worked exclusively in the criminal justice system. Um, I worked over 10 years as a prosecutor, and I've been five years I've been working as a legal advisor for the Columbia Police Department. I will give the caveat that what I say here today is just my own opinion and views. I'm not here representing the city of Columbia or the Columbia Police Department. Um, but really my views are just my experiences having worked for almost 20 years in the criminal justice system. I worked as a prosecutor in Chicago a huge city with a huge criminal justice system with 5,000 police officers, 900 states attorneys, 500 public defenders, and 300 judges where you never saw the same person twice. And I've worked in a county of 9,000 people where the prosecutor, the judge, the probation officer, and the sheriff all had offices within 10 feet of each other. Um, so I've seen just a wide range of things. Um, one of my slides about how it works is really just, I know we've got some students here tonight, and so I wanted to go through just some basics, because I think when you think about the criminal justice system, it's important to think about how many moving parts there are to this. So it starts off with an arrest. An arrest can be a police officer, a sheriff's deputy, a state trooper, MU police, state park ranger, conservation agent. We have 22,000 sworn police officers in the state of Missouri. That's how many post licenses are issued by the state of Missouri. And then a suspect is taken to jail if they're not given a summons. We have 114 counties in a city that acts like a county, so that makes 115 county jails, all with different 
slightly different policies on how they handle things. And then you have a prosecutor that will decide charges. So we have 115 prosecutor offices with everything from one prosecutor to over 50 prosecutors in the office, all with slightly different policies on how they do things. And then the judge is the one that decides whether or not to set bail, uh, usually either on a schedule or on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, we have judges mostly that are elected by the county. In the bigger jurisdictions, they're appointed by commissions, but ultimately it's up to a judge. We have hundreds of judges that are part of this system. Um, the judge or the jury has a finding of guilt uh, that would take place, and then after that is sentencing. Well, sentencing options are fine, county jail, or prison. Um, only the judge can grant probation. Um, I've seen juries try and recommend it. They'll say, please give them probation, but only the judge can actually decide if someone gets probation. Um, and then someone's sentenced to prison either at the sentencing or after probation. So as you've heard some of the other speakers talk about more people going to prison, some of them are going to prison directly upon a finding of guilt, and some people are going to prison because they tried out probation and it didn't work. They could have spent months or years on probation before actually going to prison. And then parole is a term that's used for someone who's actually already been to prison and they're under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. So for those of you that are students and are new to this, if you take away two things, take away jail is for county jail, prison is the Department of Corrections, probation is before you've gone to prison, and parole is when you come out. Because people in the system use those terms. Um, who works for the taxpayer? Really everybody in the system, right? You have law enforcement officers, you have the prosecuting attorneys, you have the judges. The juries get paid a very small amount, usually less than what's forced to have a, a good job. <laughs> Um, probation officers, you have board of parole. They're all paid for the taxpayer working together in this system. Um, something to think about here, and this always kind of is an interesting idea to me, is you think, do these people, how do they interact with the legislature, right? They have lobbyists. So Police Chiefs Association has a lobbyist. The Fraternal Order of Police has a lobbyist. The Sheriff's Association has a lobbyist. Mostly they're after their like talking about their pension and, and job benefits, but there's some issues they pick up. The prosecuting attorneys have the Missouri Association of Prosecuting Attorneys. They have lobbying efforts that they do. Uh, the judges, the same thing. Um, a lot of it's focused on pay and pension. Um, and then you have Department of Corrections that is in there sort of fighting for their budget as well. So when you think about these things, thinking about how each piece has its own part, its own budget, and its own sort of self-interest of uh, preservation in the system, and then the question, I've always wondered about this, how much does a single case cost? If we could actually ever put a dollar amount on just one case, what would it look like? I mean, you would have to sit down and do the math of the law enforcement agency that makes the arrest. So they have personnel, they have pension costs, trust me, they have pension costs, high liability and pension. There's equipment, um, there's what I call risk management, but that's basically paying out for officer misconduct, uh, everything from... Um, someone being physically injured to paying out on wrongful convictions. You have jail costs, you have pretrial detention costs. Uh, the cost of uh, having the privilege of staying in a county jail is anywhere from $25 to $90 a day. Um, the prosecutor's office has costs, um, and so does the judicial branch. They have immunity, so they don't have the same risk management costs, um, so they don't, they don't have as much of the lawsuit cost. Um, you have probation costs. Um, the more intensive the supervision of probation, the more it's going to cost. So people actually pay for the privilege to be on probation. And that's something else to think about when you're thinking about the system. Um, one of the things I learned really quickly as a prosecutor is I offered somebody the chance to go be incarcerated or go for probation. They always took probation, sometimes even if they probably shouldn't because maybe the, the, they, they are not going to be successful on probation. Um, but the higher the supervision, the more the cost of probation. And then those people actually pay for that privilege of being on probation and often have to pay restitution and other things that go with it. And then ultimately the cost of incarceration, um, which is always going to be more than the cost of probation. Um, what's one of the biggest risks? Wrongful convictions. Um, and so some of the things that we've learned over time for more accurate convictions are things that have affected it over the years. We've learned about witness identification, evidence collection, existence of video. Um, and so I think one of the things I thought about before I came here is people would say, well, what is someone actually working in the criminal justice system who works with law enforcement have to say about criminal justice reform? You know, aren't police and prosecutors going to be against reform? 
And my answer would be no, because if you ask somebody that works in a system, if there are a way to be more accurate and to be more efficient, they're going to say yes, because that's what, that's what you want. Um, and some examples of reforms that I've seen enacted in the time that I've been working in the system, witness identification practices. It's now a widely accepted best, best practice that when you show a photo lineup, uh, it used to be done kind of like uh, the Brady Bunch, where there's just six pictures all at once and you say, do you see the shooter? And now it's an accepted best practice because we've done empirical studies that you tell the person the shooter may or may not be in the following pictures. And you hand them one picture at a time and take away a picture so that they're not doing some sort of comparison between people. It actually has a higher accuracy. Um, crime labs. Courts have now said that all crime lab technicians should be subject to cross-examination. When I started out as a prosecutor almost 20 years ago, I never had to bring the crime lab technician in. I just submitted the report and it was accepted to be true. Um, DNA and blood testing, we've had a lot of improvement on techniques on that. Um, the state legislature about seven or eight years ago passed a, a state law that required all agencies to develop policies on recording confessions and interrogations of uh, homicides. Um, seems like kind of a basic thing, but the state legislature really stepped up and kind of made agencies uh, look at that. And then we have, now we have body-worn cameras. Um, the state legislature also adopted a, a law on pursuit policies that limits the number of police officers in a pursuit. Um, and those, I think, are examples of law enforcement actually accepting, embracing reform because either it was imposed on them by the legislature or because empirical studies show that it was a better practice. Um, I think there's always room to improve. So some things to consider going forward could be um, things we've learned, our jailhouse snitches and informants, how those are handled, expert testimony as it stands right now in Missouri it doesn't really take much to become an expert either for the prosecution or the defense. You just pretty much can stand up there and say, hey, I'm an expert on this. Um, explanation of rights to individuals. Um, this is something I'm starting to see uh, pick up more in law enforcement agencies where uh, the more progressive departments are explaining to people, hey, I'm going to ask for consent to search your car. You have the right to refuse this. Um, why not give people their rights so that they know what they're doing? Um, and even the use of body-worn cameras. I mean, recording the law enforcement interaction from beginning to end seems to really benefit everybody. Um, and so if you're really interested in some of this stuff, I'll, I'll suggest some places you can go to find more information. One I find really fascinating, although it's a little arcane to read, is the Missouri State Highway Patrol Charge Code Manual. It lists every crime, damaging a plant in a state park. It's in there, all of it, just crime after crime. The most obscure ones you've, you've just always wondered, is that really a crime or not? It'll tell you if it is. Um, another, I think, really good read is the Department of Justice report on Ferguson and what happened in the city of Ferguson in discussing the cycle of poverty and how the system um, in Ferguson and other municipal courts put people in a cycle that they really couldn't get out of. They have to register their car. They didn't register it. They got charged with not registering it. Now they have a fine. They showed up late to court. They got a warrant. They had to pay for the warrant recall. And it just constantly never ending stream of paying for things. And then the municipal courts basically became debtor prisons. And it's what the Department of Justice found. So if you haven't ever read the Department of Justice report on Ferguson, it's a really interesting read. And it happened right here in Missouri. Um, there's been a lot of, I've seen people just really embrace reform in that area. Um, I want to say there's something like 80 municipal courts this year alone that are going to be absorbed into the state court system. And so Missouri is really moving away from that. So um, when thinking about these things, really don't discount the idea that I think law enforcement can be a part of it when they see that there's something broken. I think they will fix it. Thank you. They only gave me seven minutes, so I'm going to talk fast. And I'm going to talk about who's behind bars, what the price is, and what we can do about it. The United States has less than 5% of the world's population, but almost a quarter of its prisoners. And in Missouri, as Aaron noted, we have the eighth highest incarceration rate, and we're number one fastest growing female prison population in the nation. Our prison population in Missouri has grown 300% in the last 30 years. Nonviolent in Missouri, from the data I've found, um, makes up over 50% of our prisoners. Our elderly prison population has doubled since 2005, and those are expensive prisoners to have. 
And um, the incarceration of people who failed su supervision, be it probation or parole, makes up 49% of our prison population. We have direct costs on our criminal justice system and indirect, I'll talk about the direct first. Direct costs on our system are substantial, $270 billion a year, that works out to $870 per person per year is spent on our system, and that's a growth of 70% over the last two decades. Um, there are tremendous indirect costs um, from this um, system. Um, there are authors that have argued that our system has resulted in an undercast of citizens that are affected by it because of all the collateral consequences to them. Um, but there are, there are costs that must be paid well after a criminal sentence is completed. Uh, remarkably, 70 million Americans, so one in three American adults, has a criminal record at this point. And the collateral costs of that are paid not just by those individuals, but by their families and communities too. One example is that the research shows that higher levels of marriage yield stronger economic growth, more upward mobility economically, less child poverty, and less violent crime. Studies also show that incarceration decreases marriage. And the price to children is quite high. It puts them at higher risk factors for antisocial and violent behavior, for becoming incarcerated themselves, becoming expelled from school, um, increased risk of poverty, and notably, uh, given recent events, an increased distrust in government and the criminal justice system. Um, they're less likely to believe that a police use of force was legitimate. Um, more indirect cost of this is that people with criminal records are, uh, have a harder time getting jobs, and they're 50% less likely to get a job interview or offer. And when they do get jobs, the previously incarcerated make 10 to 40% less money than their peers. The bars on occupational licenses are very widespread and problematic because one in four employed persons in America holds an occupational license of some sort. Um, the cost of this going through the system results in lost earnings for families and a lot of fines, fees, and costs. It also negatively affects their access to health care, housing, transportation, and even food security. The bottom line is that the community ends up spending more on social services and there's less money received um, in tax revenue. There's also a price that we have to pay when we have less trust in our system and that's less safety for the public. People are more likely to obey the law when they believe that those that are enforcing it have authority that's legitimate. And legi legitimacy, excuse me, is only conferred upon those believed to be acting in procedurally just ways. The converse of that is that if they don't think the system is set up fairly or legitimately, they're less likely to obey the law and we're less able to solve crimes if there's not cooperation between the community and law enforcement. I think there's, an, there's evidence that there's a lack of trust in Missouri from incidents like Stokely and Ferguson and there's evidence that it's resulted in a lack of safety, considering that St. Louis in 2015 was named number one most dangerous city to live in in the entire country. I think part of what's led to this lack of trust has been the public defender crisis in Missouri. We ranked 49th in per capita indigent defense spending. This is Missouri compared to the surrounding states. Um, it's kind of pathetic what we spend per capita compared to our neighbors. And the higher caseloads of public defenders results in inadequate defense being provided to the accused in Missouri. Well, without an adequate defense being provided, we cannot have confidence that the integrity of the result of the criminal justice system is accurate at all. We as a society can't have confidence in the integrity of those results. And also, the people that receive inadequate defenses are less likely to trust the system, as are their families. I found from being a public defender that the converse is also true. When I provided an adequate defense, those people were, had more confidence in the system and uh, more belief in the legitimacy of the process. So the price of our public defender crisis is less public safety and less liberty, and it's something we should look at. So the good news is that other states around the country have enacted right on crime reforms that have resulted in higher safety and lower costs. Texas, Georgia, South Carolina, Oklahoma, they're all getting results, and we can too. Um, some ideas I've listed here, um, we could, we could increase the different types of drug possession that is just a misdemeanor. I had one client when I was a public defender, he had one Adderall pill, he was 17. Um, no one bonded him out, he was from a poor family, he'd taken an Adderall to clean his trailer better, and um, he wanted 
he was offered probation and took it. I was like, let me fight this. You're going to have a felony on your record the rest of your life. And uh, he went out of jail, so he went ahead and pled to get out on probation and is a felon now um, because of one Adderall pill. That's silly. Other states don't make every possession of tiny amounts of drugs a felony like we do. Um, we could increase the amount of marijuana it takes to make it a felony level. Um, there's other things that we could look at eliminating. We could just cut the length of sentences across the board. A lot of people have looked at eliminating or reducing mandatory minimums. But we could also look at reducing maximums. Uh, we didn't used to have it be 30, 10 to 30 or life for a Class A felony. I think it used to be a maximum of 25. But um, we could parole to reflect the fact that people age out of crime. I was interested to learn that a person that's 55 years or older is 10 times less likely to commit a crime than a 23-year-old, even if that person committed crimes when they were younger. It's just a part of nature, people age out, they grow up, they grow out of it, um, nonsense behavior. But our, our incarceration system doesn't always take that into account, the aging out of crime. Oh, and one thing I'd like to mention is uh, Oklahoma does something interesting. They'll credit 100 days for an associate's degree or 200 days for a bachelor's degree against your sentence. I think we could consider something like that. And also, there's a US Department of Labor certifications our prisoners get when they do skilled labor for 2,000 hours. We could consider giving them credit when they achieve that kind of uh, work. So we could broaden our expungement laws. Uh, we could reduce and eliminate occupational license exclusions and other silly things like it's illegal for a felon to sell a lottery ticket or alcohol in Missouri. So that, that means like my indigent clients, their only job options are fast food or construction. That's it. They can't work at a store or, any, or a gas station or anything because of silly regulations like they can't sell it lottery tickets or alcohol. We could get rid of, like, stop revoking people's, if they don't pay their child support, they take their driver's license away. Well, how are they going to pay their child support in Missouri? We have to drive everywhere when we do that. Rand Paul came to Missouri at a Show Me Institute event. I, or was it? I, yeah. And I told him that. He couldn't believe that we did that. But um, we could do something easy, like issue a state ID to prisoners when they get out so they're just that much closer to getting set up legitimately. We could raise the age and not be the last in the country to do that. Um, we're one of five states left where the age of majority would be charged in, as an adult with a crime is below 18. And uh, we could have more school choice. One interesting study found that kids in urban Chicago, at-risk youth, uh, were 60% less likely when they won the lotto to get a higher performing school to get arrested than the kids that entered that same lotto and lost it. So. Um, we could look at juvenile justice reforms like decriminalizing truancy uh, to reduce you know, incarceration and getting the kids in the system, which increases recidivism for those kids. Um, one thing that hasn't been mentioned by other panelists is we could have a statute requiring a special prosecutor be appointed for officer-involved shootings and in-custody deaths. Other states have done that. Another interesting thing Texas just did was they required AG notification when law enforcement officers shoot a person that wasn't required previously and there was no like, good data on it, so they required that notification. The more good news is that Missouri has efforts underway for criminal justice reform. There are two task, force that, two task forces that were appointed this year, uh, one by the Missouri Supreme Court, which I uh, was lucky enough to be honored to be appointed to, and one uh, the governor appointed uh, a task force as well, and uh, we can talk about that in the Q&A. So thank you very much. I'm going to set my timer, but I think my phone will shut down. So if I go over time, that's my excuse. Um, I'm Eric Schmidt. Uh, currently, I'm the uh, Missouri State Treasurer, but in a prior life, before last November, I served in the Missouri State Senate. Um, my district and where I'm from is in suburban St. Louis County. <clears throat> I grew up actually in North St. Louis County uh, near the airport. Um, my grandfather grew up in Ferguson, which is what led me to some of the municipal court reform efforts that go back to 2014. So in the wake of um, Ferguson, um, I grew up in North County. I was at the time the senior state senator from St. Louis County, and I was a lawyer. Um, and so uh, like many people who were watching what was happening, uh, I wanted to understand better, um, so I spent some time talking to people, 
I didn't wear my uh, state senator hat or t-shirt, not that I had a hat or a t-shirt, but, um, but I wanted to listen. And um, so I listened to, to people who were on the street, I listened to law enforcement, uh, clergy, uh, anybody that I could talk to to try to better understand what was happening. And what I, uh, what I learned was that there was a real breakdown of trust between uh, people in their government and people in their courts. And so as a lot of data came to light and there was some good journalism about this and there were some other folks who were contributing to this effort, we learned a lot about the gravity of the municipal court systems uh, and its impact it was having on real people in St. Louis County. Now I will make this, I'll, I'll probably dovetail this in at some point, but this is an issue across the state of Missouri and not just in the state of Missouri, by the way, but particularly unique and concentrated in St. Louis County. St. Louis County has 91 municipalities. St. Louis County has 81 municipal courts. St. Louis County has 61 separate police departments. St. Louis County at the time had 400,000 outstanding warrants. It has a million people. It's the largest county in the state. Accounted for 22% of the state's population, but had 50% of the fines and fees that were exacted from people. So there was a real problem. Uh, and you didn't need to be a rocket scientist uh, to figure that out. Uh, to put that in perspective in real terms, and I try to use this as an example, and my grandmother still lives in St. Anne. Thankfully, she does not have the same last name as me. Um, but the city of St. Anne, which is near where I grew up, used to have the largest mall in the country, Northwest Plaza. Before Mall of America um, was built, Northwest Plaza was the biggest mall in the United States of America. A lot of sales tax revenue. Um, that mall shut down. Coincidentally, a speed trap went up uh, after that mall shut down. St. Anne went from writing about 1,000 tickets a year to 10,000 tickets a year and getting uh, a little less than $500,000 in revenue from traffic tickets and fines to over $3 million a year in traffic tickets and fines. Um, a little bit further down the road, in the, as we kind of proposed some legislation to deal with this, it was uncovered that a little bit further down Highway 70 on the airport, there's a little town called Edmondson, Edmondson, Missouri, uh, where the mayor actually wrote a letter to the police chief. Uh, perhaps the most surprising thing about this was that it was in writing, but wrote a letter to the police chief telling him that his job depended on the number of tickets that he wrote every month. Um, and, remind, and he wanted him to remind his, his officers uh, in that department about the same thing. Um, in Bell Fountain Neighbors, which is a little bit further north in North County, they not only did they have ticket quotas, they actually had arrest quotas for the month. So if you think about that, in the United States of America, a police department, a police officer was told that your job depends on you meeting a quota for the number of people you're arresting that month. And so as we dug a little bit deeper into this, and the data was really instructive, um, better together, had a lot of interesting data on this as we worked with a lot of groups across the state. Um, but it was very clear that this was a revenue generating operation by a lot of cities. And that people were being viewed as uh, ATMs. In fact, a lot of city managers were budgeting more for traffic tickets and fines in the next budget year than they were in the, in the current budget year. So unless they were uh, Nostradamus or soothsayers, um, they were working towards a number. And um, so it was a real problem. So, uh, this was, by the way, not unique, as I mentioned, in St. Louis County. Statewide, um, there was a 20, nearly a 30% increase in three years from 2012 to 2015 in the number of fines and fees that were associated in municipal courts. So for a lot of cities, their court system was being used as a revenue generating operation. Um, and the stories about how that played out with real people were really heartbreaking. I mean, in, in, even in a sense where people would come in to try to make partial payment, and they were being denied the, the ability to make partial payment, uh, which only exacerbated their issues. Or if you grew up, well, I grew up on the St. Charles Rock Road corridor, which means nothing to most people here, but you have probably about 17 cities in a seven mile uh, stretch on one particular road. And if you were going from your home to a job further down the rock road, you were running a gauntlet. So if you had a traffic ticket, um, and let's say you missed a court date, let's say you're working nights or you just missed, life happened and you missed a court date. Uh, you not only had that 
uh, a warrant now out for your arrest for that, but you had a failure to appear, which was an additional charge. And so there were all these charges that were being added to one missed court appearance that a $100 fine would sometimes turn into a seven or an $800 fine. So if you didn't have the money to pay the $100 fine, you really didn't have the money to pay the $800 fine. And so let's say you were, your original ticket was having a taillight out. Well, uh, if you didn't, I don't know if anybody's had a taillight fixed or a headlight fixed, it's getting a little bit more expensive. Let's say you didn't do that in 30 days and then you got pulled over again. I mean, you were in jail. You were in jail sometimes for longer than a week uh, your, now your employment uh, was in jeopardy, your housing was in jeopardy. We were perpetuating cycles of poverty, creating them, perpetuating them, and we had created, particularly in St. Louis County, but another place, uh, really debtor prisons, which are supposed to be illegal in this country. And so this was a serious challenge. And so we came into the 2015 legislative session and we wanted to do something about it. Um, and so it was a perhaps, well, the governor, then governor, called it once we got it done, the, probably the most sweeping municipal reform bill in the history of our state. And so we did a bunch of things. We lowered the amount, the, the revenue that a city could get from traffic tickets and fines, made more clear definitions of what exactly those were. We eliminated the ability to have a separate charge for failure to appear. You, got, you had to be able to see a judge within 48 hours. Um, you could allow kids in the courtroom um, there were 40% of the municipal courts in St. Louis County that wouldn't allow kids in the courtroom. Anything that you could do to make it more difficult for people to actually come and, if, and pay their fine and have their day in court, um, a lot of cities were using, were creating obstacles for that to actually happen, let alone the cities that were getting 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70% of their revenue from traffic tickets and fines. You might imagine that those, some of those cities weren't big fans of the legislation. Uh, that moved forward and some of it was struck down. We also had municipal standards uh, that were included in there like you had to have an accredited police department which by the way I will point out law enforcement was very supportive of this legislation. So was the ACLU. So were African American clergy members. So were Tea Party groups. So when you have all those groups kind of coming together endorsing something uh, either the world is going to end in 24 hours <laughs> or you're on to something. And so uh, we felt good about that and we were able to get something done. And I know that we talk a lot about the challenges and, we, and there's more things to do. But we should also remember that we did something in Missouri that is being replicated in other places now. I, I got to be a speaker at the National Urban League Conference in St. Louis a couple months ago. Um, and they were taking that message back to their communities. Uh, the mayor of Baltimore at the time reached out about some of the things that we were doing you know, after Ferguson in this regard. But I will point out one thing that is just an interesting side note and I will I'll wrap this up. My phone screen has gone black so I'm sure that I'm over seven minutes. But when we did that though, when we actually did that, when we limited the amount of money cities could get from traffic tickets and fines, guess what they did? They went to non-moving violations. Mm -hmm. So Pagedale, for example, started citing people for mismatched blinds and drapes <laughs> and glatten grass being too high. And so we came back the next year and put limits of what you could get. Well, actually what we did is we lumped in the non-moving with the moving. So your cap now included all of that. And you can still enforce your laws and it's important to obey the speed limit, but people shouldn't be thrown uh, in jail for misdemeanors, which is really what these, these are municipal infractions actually. Um, and uh, so I think we sent a very clear message that we do not want to see cities using people as ATMs and government doesn't exist to find new and innovative ways to extract more and more from people. So, thank you for the time. Uh, I just have a few questions based on your presentation, uh, your, your various presentations. Uh, the uh, director of the state public defender system, uh, Michael Barrett recently said, he's a member of the governor's task force that Jennifer talked about, he said, if we want to bring down violent crime, we need to do a better job separating the people we are mad at from the people we are afraid of. And Barry and Aaron, do you have thoughts on how we might do that? We're mad at all criminals, uh, and, you know, those that have committed the so-called uh, mala in se crimes and those that have committed the, the, the mala prohibitive crimes, they've broken the law. We're afraid of the people that have committed the mal and say crimes. So I think one of the one of the ways to attack that is to to reduce or eliminate some jail or prison sentences for the so-called malaprohibitive offenses, such as uh, 
possession of drugs, perhaps, first offense. Uh, you know, a malaprohibited crime is something that's not recognized as being inherently wrong or evil, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a crime only because the government says it's a crime. You know, so there could be less of a focus on those types of offenses and eliminating prison or reducing prison for those types of offenses is one way to attack it. Yeah, and again, there, there's really two main ways where the criminal justice system works. One is you're deterring people from committing crime to begin with, or you're just removing bad seeds, like getting them out of there. So we've had this proliferation of mandatory minimums and truth in sentencing and things where that are basically one size fits all. And they're things that oftentimes apply to nonviolent offenders. So what we want to do is, I'm not suggesting you know, an across the board reduction of minimums, but what we should do is give more discretion actually. I think there's this perception that if we don't have these mandatory minimums and these inflexible rules, that judges are just going to be letting people off the hook left and right. Uh, but the research does not suggest that. The research actually suggests that, uh, in general, when you do give some discretion, at least in certain cases, to judges, that the outcomes are better. So I think we can go in that direction. Eric, when you were working with your colleagues on reform, did you run into uh, elected officials who were afraid that uh, they would be accused of being soft on crime if they, if they entertained reform? Um, yeah, I, th I think that um, there, there is that concern. Uh, I think that uh, you have to be very clear about what you're dealing with. And uh, for us, we were dealing with, um, and, and you had to make the case, right? So uh, some of the statistics that I cited, I'm sure there, there are many others that, that I did not mention, but at the time, uh, we certainly spoke to people about it. I think, you know, what we got, probably our biggest challenge was Senate Bill 5, and, and afterwards was probably a... Um, a little bit of a different view based on where you were from in the state of what of the severity of the issue. Uh, clearly in St. Louis County um, and in, in, uh, in other metros, um, and quite frankly where you had a lot of municipalities, um, this was much more of a pronounced issue. Um, it was, but there were, but we spent a lot of time educating people about small speed traps all across the state. In fact, the law that we amended was named after Max Creek which was a notorious speed trap uh, in Missouri um, that originally this thing started by saying you can only get 50% of your revenue from traffic tickets and fines, then it was 40, then it was 30. We brought it down to 20. In St. Louis County, we made it lower than that. The court said you can't have it. I disagree with that decision, but, um, but the court said it has to be at 20%. But those are some pretty significant strides. But I think um, the biggest issue for us was making sure that people understood that in their own communities, this was affecting real people because it was a barrier for people to be productive members. And it, and it was a disservice and a dishonor to the dignity of every person who should be treated um, with respect. And now, uh, that doesn't mean that you don't punish wrongdoing, but this was very clearly an example of uh, kind of revenue generation. And I think that there are probably some other examples out there um, that are ripe for the picking where we could zero in on uh, when it's about the money and it's really not about justice. Uh, I have one more question for Nicole and, and Jennifer, and then I encourage, if you raise your hand, uh, uh, my colleague Emily will come to you with your question. Uh, uh, Nicole, you showed uh, behind the, uh, on, on the slide behind you some of the people who work for the taxpayer. I'm curious to know from both of you, what are the incentives of these people? Eric talked about at the municipal level, sometimes the incentive was to raise funds. Uh, I'm a layman, I have no background in criminal justice. I sometimes think that a prosecutor's incentive is to prosecute as many people as possible. But, uh, but what, what do you think, in your experience, actually is the incentive? I'll say as a prosecutor, I had very few cases where there was any financial incentive for me. Uh, the rare exception was uh, bad checks. They actually had a state law they did so that prosecutors would be incentivized to prosecute bad checks. And so a prosecutor's office could actually make money for their office to buy supplies, to pay staff, every time they prosecuted a bad check. It's kind of obscure now. Um, and then that's when they went forward with a restitution bill. That was one of the lobbying efforts that the Prosecuting Attorney Association did. It really affected larger prosecutors' offices, not the smaller offices. But the fines that are collected in state court go to the local schools under the school funding formula. And then that money is discounted as local effort. So basically the fines go to general revenue. So when I was a prosecutor, I mean, 
there wasn't really any great incentive for the for me to collect fines. I mean, as opposed to trying to get somebody to pay the board bill for how the time the time they spent in jail. Um, one other incentive that I mean I ignored, but I know other prosecutors did, and obviously was if someone spent time in the county jail waiting uh, the disposition of their case, if they're sent to prison, I'd get a check for the county uh, reimbursement. Not so if I reduced it to a misdemeanor and gave them credit for the time served in the county jail. And so there is some economics to some of those decisions. I'll be honest, I think most prosecutors do not pay that much attention to it. Um, I think it's, it's rare, but there are some built in. Well, they're supposed to be driven by public safety. Um, that should be the goal. I don't think it always is. What strikes me is how powerful the prosecutors are. It's just incredible and it's not really uh, well known. Um, we have like 115 different head prosecutors and you know hundreds of prosecutors working for them, not to mention all the municipal ones. They all kind of set their own policies behind closed doors as to what they'll charge, whether they'll charge people, what they'll charge them with, and what they'll dispose of cases for. So you're not dealing with one criminal justice system in Missouri, but hundreds of different you know criminal justice systems that are taking place. And um, so I think, uh, their goal should be public safety and the public should hold them accountable when they are working um, towards other purposes. Does anybody uh, in the audience have questions for him? Yes, uh, ma'am, in the second row. Hi, I'm Cherie Tolson Reich. Um, let me preface that I'm a freshman state legislator, uh, but before that, I was a municipal court administrator for 30 years and I've been running a busy law firm for the last six. I have several questions and comments. You may or may not want to write these down. Uh, number one, raise the age. I sit on the Judiciary Committee. We are uh, wanting to do that. Um, I, I think it will pass the House easily. I always like to say this year we had a meltdown over in the Senate. Not our senator here from Boone County, of course. But anyway, I think number one, raise the age is a good thing. We'll save the state a lot of money and to help these 17-year-olds a lot. Uh, number two, uh, I would like one of the two ladies uh, in a moment to talk about why is the incarceration rate for women up like 50% if there's some thoughts or reasoning behind that. Uh, on the Senate Bill 5, I was a court administrator when that went into effect. And um, a lot of the municipal courts are where people have their most interactions. Uh, and now a lot of municipal courts are doing away with their courts and they're going to the associate circuit courts. All the ones here in Boone County have except for Columbia. But a lot of the smaller towns are doing that, and I think that's a good thing. Um, number two, uh, or three, whatever it was, um, Ma I was going to bring up Max Creek, but uh, Treasurer Schmidt already did. And so when I ran in municipal court, people say, oh, you're just a speed trap. And um, I'm not a lawyer. I don't give legal advice. But if there's one thing I told defendants, I said, the number one reason people get stopped, in my opinion, is your license plates. They're either expired or you have truck plates on a car, et cetera. And I said, and then once you're pulled over for a plate violation, you have no driver's license, no insurance, or a warrant for your arrest, or you're drunk, et cetera, et cetera. So my advice as a non-lawyer is make sure your plates are legal and you may not get pulled over, okay? Um, other thing is I've always wondered about, I think it's Vermont, um, maybe just one or two states in the country. I'd like somebody to talk about jury nullification. Thank you. Uh, well, Nicole, Jennifer, Great. can you speak to the increase in female incarceration? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Sheree. The one thing that's driving female incarceration increases in Missouri is, and across the country is the exploding growth of rural jail populations. It's uh, led to a great increase in both female and white incarceration rates in jails, um, whereas in urban areas, both black and white jail incarceration has decreased. It's going up substantially in rural areas. And one suspected reason is the financial incentives that rural jurisdictions have to build jails to house um, inmates from other jurisdictions in the federal government as revenue streams. So they build bigger jails than they fill them, and it leads to increases in jail incarceration rates. And uh, the governor's task force, their first report showed that like 85% of the females going into prison are nonviolent offenses. So uh, that's definitely something worth looking into. Uh, 
I would, I would say that what I saw as a prosecutor when I started to see more women coming through the system were drug offenses, uh, a lot of uh, sort of the property offenses where someone's forging a check, maybe they got a hold of grandmother's account, they forged a check, they are trying to, a lot of this sort of property, and so when Jennifer talks or about- Or accomplice. Yeah, they're accomplice to something. I saw a lot of that uh, in my years. I, I would see someone, uh, there'd be a traffic stop and there's a man and a woman in the car. Please put this in your purse. They're not gonna find you guilty, you're a woman. And, and it turns out, no, it's in your purse, right next to your driver's license. That, that, that was not a trick that worked very well. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, a variety of things, um, but I do think a lot of it was the increase of drugs and then also with property crimes and you're in a recession, uh, if someone can pay off their restitution, they're more likely to get a misdemeanor. If they can't pay their restitution, they're usually put on felony mm -hmm. probation and given five years to try and slowly pay that off. And so there's a big difference between how someone uh, that commits a property crime is treated if they have the money to pay it off versus if they don't. Thank you. It never happened to me. Have you had it, Jennifer? Is it? I, I will just mention it is, for those that don't know what the term means, jury nullification is where a jury will discharge or acquit a defendant who has been clearly proven guilty by the government. In other words, the, the jury will essentially make their decision on whether they agree with the law or not. And the last I knew, this was not something that an attorney could argue for in Missouri. Is that, is that correct? No, you have to take an oath that you'll follow the instructions. Unless yeah. the legislature wants to pass a statute allowing yeah. jury nullification, right. it would technically not be yeah. Did you mention something about raise the age? I'll just say real quick about raise the age. A lot, of, a lot of one's path, either into criminality or avoiding it, is actually determined based on what happens when you're young. So what we absolutely want to do is reduce the number of people who are, you know, teenagers who are not graduating from high school. And that's something where if you, if you incarcerate them, they're not going to graduate, and if they're not going to graduate, that, the likelihood of them committing crimes is much higher. So raising the age is a very sensible thing to do. And having been a criminal defense attorney 10 years and having been a 17-year-old at one time, 17 is like the dumbest point in any human being's <laughs> life. That's the last thing we need to throw them in adult prisons over is dumb things they do when they're 17 years old. And Representative, I would also say, I also say, even though it's your first year, you've learned very quickly, when in doubt, blame the Senate, which is what, <laughs> which is what you... <laughs> Ethan Thampy. Um, uh, several years ago, I was, had, a, had a kind of surreal experience, but I was in Riverside, California at a federal court hearing for the city of San Bernardino, which was in a federal bankruptcy hearing because it was missing $6 million a month payments to uh, CalPERS, the California Public Retirement Empl uh, um, the, the Pension System for California. And I know you, Treasurer Schmidt, you have uh, uh, doing some work on the, tra uh, the, pension over, uh, the pension issues here in Missouri, but uh, I was curious, you know, uh, especially in terms of the administration of the criminal justice system, do we see a lot of issues with, with uh, these public sector uh, agencies essentially uh, creating uh, part of the issue with uh, the pension liabilities that we have? Um, well, I think, look, uh, I think how, pens how, how pensions probably interplay, and I'll leave this because it's a little, little off topic, but um, what we're seeing in, in every state, but Missouri is not immune from this, is that uh, the largest state pension plan that I now serve as a board member on a state treasurer, around 2000 was 100% funded. Now it's about 60% funded. And actually that is even probably not even really accurate because that assumes a 7.5% rate of return, which no one's getting. So if you really kind of, you know, uh, unpeel the onion here um, and you get a reasonable rate of return plugged in, you use a more accurate mortality table, our pensions are probably about 50% funded. And the reason why that's relevant is that um, when that happens, it starts to, the employer contribution number now, which for the first time is over 20% of, the, it becomes a higher and higher number. So the legislature has to appropriate more and more money to keep the pensions solvent, um, which takes away dollars that you could spend on other things, roads, education, other initiatives. And so I think, although this, this is an entirely forum, in, in a, a separate form in and of itself, we have taken the, um, the the responsibility of letting people know the the gravity of the of this pension crisis that is no longer on the horizon, but rather 
at our doorstep in Missouri. So it's a big issue. It's not something that like grabs the headlines, um, but you can see in places like Illinois where um, they literally had to raise taxes 32% just to put a Band-Aid and pay their bills, but didn't do anything to address the underlying structural issues. And I would also, so I, I was gonna mention structures, but I think one, it's very important probably in this group to talk about how important it is to be mindful of the structures you're creating or reforming. Because those are the things, in my experience as a, as a senator and now as, as treasurer, that um, I'm very focused on the structural kind of reform that you, you really need to focus on and, and be very vigilant on. Because that's the kind of stuff that outlasts any particular personality or idea. Um, and I use that in the context of the municipal court reform too, particularly in St. Louis County. One of the things I didn't mention was if a city went over the threshold, um, they had to remit the excess to the, um, the state school fund. But we also created a death penalty option so that individuals in that particular municipality would get the chance to vote on uh, disincorporation. In St. Louis County, there are 90 municipalities now. Um, and um, I don't know what the magic number is, um, but I know 90 is too many. And I know that you don't, in a three square mile area, uh, need you know, seven uh, court clerks, seven city clerks, seven mayors, seven boards of aldermen, seven city attorneys, seven prosecuting attorneys, uh, all of the, everything that you're doing to, to sort of feed this bureaucracy that exists, which as we saw in the wake of Ferguson with the statistics, many of which were just continuing to go out and use a police force to generate revenue to continue to exist. That is what creates inequities. That is what creates uh, injustices. That is what creates interactions that shouldn't happen. And why law enforcement was saying at the time, and still do, we would much rather spend our time uh, being in the community, involved in community policing than writing traffic tickets all day long. So they were part of the system too, as being sent out to work speed traps as opposed to building the trust uh, in the community. And it was mentioned by at least one speaker also, um, that it, trust in those kinds of institutions like our judiciary are really, really important to maintain. And if it's simply viewed as an economic or revenue generating enterprise, we do much harm uh, to really, really important constitutional construct in this country. Hi, Jeanette Mott Oxford from Empower Missouri. I'm really encouraged by uh, what I heard here and, uh, and at the Justice Reinvestment Task Force meeting last week. Whether you're at an Empower Missouri uh, Criminal Justice Task Force uh, meeting or, or here tonight or uh, with uh, the Department of Corrections and other um, um, bodies on that reinvestment task force last week, we're calling for the same things. A geriatric uh, parole, uh, raise the age, uh, judges to have more discretion around risk assessment instead of mandatory minimums. I think we can get something done in that kind of a bipartisan, uh, multi-thematic um, multi uh, kind of uh, uh, idea front that, that's uh, emerging right now. So that's great. Uh, Mr. Hedlund um, uh, dangled a, a, a point about ban the box earlier that I'd like to inquire about. Um, you, you said that it leads to discrimination. Do you mean just taking the box off of application forms or do you mean fair chance hiring where you actually go through the whole process and don't do the background check until there's been a provisional offer of employment? Wouldn't a change in attitude where we actually um, don't have the discriminatory mi mindset be the solution to that so that we carry out the fair chance hiring in a very fair way? Sure. So first of all, for, for people who are not aware of what ban the box is, it basically means that either throughout the whole process or at least until a certain point in the hiring process, basically not allowing employers to check whether a prospective employee has a criminal record. And the idea is, let's give people a chance, right? Because there's a lot of evidence that suggests that when, when as soon as an employer discovers that an applicant has a criminal record, they stop thinking about, they, don't, they stop considering them. So it, it makes, it sounds very sensible. The problem is that what creates is a lot of what's called statistical discrimination. So instead of being able to directly see whether you have a criminal record, employers try to infer through other observable characteristics, and that could be race or who knows what. Uh, there's even people who've been you know, discriminated against based on tattoos. They're trying to figure out ways to determine what's the likelihood of this applicant being a criminal. So what's happened, and there's been a lot of studies on this, is that you actually have higher racial discrimination in instances where you do ban the box. 
So it's one of those things where the, the, the goal is admirable, but the outcome is, is quite unfortunate. Um, and it's, it's, especially with the, pre the prevalence of occupational licenses, it just kind of really restricts the kind of jobs that people are able to get. I, I have a strong opinion on this. I do believe in giving people chances, but I'm sick of less freedom being the answer to every problem we have as an employer. Like it should be my right to decide whether I want to box on there or not. And these well-meaning reforms often have consequences we don't think of. Like the Columbia measure would criminalize putting a box on there. So then that's just more over criminalization in my mind. Yeah. And actually, let, let me add one other thing, an, an alternative. So one reason that employee, employers are worried about hiring people with criminal records is the idea that if they do hire a criminal, that they could, and then that criminal commits a crime, that they, the employer, could be sued for negligent hiring, you know, for hiring someone who's going to be, be creating trouble. So what we could do instead is we could have some kind of certificates that the government would issue for people who have gone through the prison system, shown good behavior, gone through programs, et cetera, that say, this is someone who's an employable person, and it's something that basically reduces some of the criminal liability, some of the, the liability that an employer would have if they happen to hire someone with a criminal record. Let, let me frame my comment real quickly by uh, saying that I may be the only ex-con uh, in this room, okay? Having served uh, 25 months in a federal prison camp and two months in a maximum security prison in Geneva, Switzerland, 20 years ago. I've also been, all of you folks, an academic, a prosecutor, a defense attorney, a government official, but never an elected government official, Eric. So this comes from, from this background in terms of making this particular comment. Now I'm delighted by very much I hear, uh, I was at least in the background part of what Eric did with the municipal court reform, hugging around with a lot of folks in the St. Louis area. But what you have not commented on, okay, is, is, is important and I think fascinating. By the way, in terms of ban the box, just real quickly, the U.S. Probation Office for the Eastern District of Missouri, headed by a man named Doug Burris, and he and I were on a panel last week at Lindenwood University, said that his 2,200 people that he has on supervised release has an unemployment rate of 3.8%. Doug Burris's office typically runs a recidivism rate way less than 10%, okay? And he's not dealing with cream puffs. But the point is this, Eric, when you talk about the northern uh, municipalities in particular, the underlying current in all of that is, of course, the change from black to white, starting with integration back in the 60s, and those municipalities using their authority to persecute the black folks in favor of the white folks. In Ferguson, that burden never fell on you folks. The criminal justice system they describe is largely for the poor and the minorities. Most of you folks in this audience are basically immune to it. The same thing that the kids in Clayton, Missouri, right across the boundary, from St. Louis uh, get in trouble for, the black kids get five to 10, okay? So what you have failed to describe in anything you're doing is the institutionalized racism that is at the core of St. Louis and Kansas City. And you describe the symptoms of that racism and you can throw out all the numbers in the world, but yet you don't understand what is underlying and pushing that what have you achieved? Quick example, then I'll quit. All of you, who's a baseball fan? Who knows who Branch Rickey was? The guy who gave Jackie Robinson the start. Broke the color line in baseball, right? He invested in and founded the city of town and country in St. Louis County. Anybody here from town and country? It's in the 40s, I believe. Those restrictions, the covenants and restrictions that run with the land, in town and country, say this, that only Caucasians of the Christian faith can live in town and country. And St. Louis has over 320 of those covenants and restrictions. And when those were finally struck down 
by the United States Supreme Court in the late 1940s, what happened? Okay, the folks found other ways to keep black people out of their neighborhoods. So I'd like you to comment on how you can root out, because what our criminal justice system does, it puts the greatest burdens on the people least able to deal with those burdens, starting with motor vehicles. Well, I mean, I think we should, clearly there, there's, a, uh, there's a history, and I, and I don't dispute at all the, some of the, um, the restrictive covenants that were put in place by a lot of cities, and neighborhoods, actually, um, too, when subdivisions were being developed. But I'd also say that there's, it's much more complicated than that when you talk about the prolif proliferation of municipalities in St. Louis County. Um, some people have even surmised it has a lot to do with the folks, um, the, the Germans who settled in St. Louis, who came pre-unification of Germany, who were used to smaller municipalities. Um, a lot of the municipalities that I referenced earlier are, uh, uh, you have mayors and city managers that are African American. Um, so I think it's, um, there are a lot, there are a lot of, I'm, I'm not dismissing the issue, but there's a lot of other issues in play. And the point I was trying to make was that when a city is dealing with a loss of a tax base like St. Anne, what we can't accept and what we need to reform are efforts within that city to try to get more and more revenue from other sources like traffic tickets and fines because a disproportionate number of people who are being caught up in that system were poor and were African American. And so, uh, uh, in, in a lot of the cities, by the way, that fought the reforms and ultimately sued were a lot of the small municipalities in North St. Louis County that ha had African-American leadership. And I, my perspective on this was uh, I was always going to side with the people who were being caught up in this because I believed it was an injustice. So I think all of us have a responsibility um, to fight for the things that we believe in and for a more just and fair judicial system, no question. And, and one thing I should point out is we should ha when we think about people going to jail, you should not have in mind that most of these people are getting convicted. Most of the people who are going to jail are actually going there through plea deals. And over time, the pre sorry, 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 going to prison. Yes, we, we've talked about the distinction between local jails and, and state prisons. Uh, layman terms here. But the people who are, getting, who are going to prison are mostly pleading out. And the prevalence of people who are being given uh, basically large um, bail has gone up. And, if you're, and what that means is we actually have a large, people, a large population of people in jail for a long period of time prior to the trial. And when you're in jail for a long period of time, that creates a lot of added pressure to basically give in and, and, take, a, and take a plea deal and go to jail, so, go to prison. So we have to think about the financial incentives, the, the bail that falls disproportionately on the poor and also disproportionately on minorities, and we kind of have to address it in a very systematic way. And I would, I would add, too, that what I experienced in being in different areas was, depending on the county I was in, there were people that would beg to go to DOC because the county jail conditions were so bad. And that's not true of every county jail, but there are some county jails where either it was too expensive to turn the heat on or the sticky bun for breakfast and lunch just was so awful that they couldn't wait to get to DOC or the, the ban on smoking, whatever it might be. So I, that pretrial detention can really change someone's incentive to be guilty. I would agree with that. I did reference the undercast system that's being created by our system. And uh, I've almost finished with the, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. It's a really eye-opening book um, because the system is set up in a way that appears color neutral, but given the amount of discretion that prosecutors have or um, police may have, it can be applied differently to different races. And uh, there's no arguing that there has been some disparities. And I think it's just good for us to stay mindful of that and um, be aware of that as we try to reform the process. So um, along with the gentleman that said that there are a couple of things that you didn't mention, um, a thing that I have a question about is how do you plan to combat the school to prison pipeline other than raising the age? Because as it seen, uh, schools, especially minority schools, you could say in Clayton and you know, Ferguson and where there's um, officers that are involved inside of the school that know certain students and all of a sudden those students that are well known by the officers and placed inside of a educational system that says that they are at risk 
they end up becoming inside of, well, involved inside of the criminal justice system. Um, how do you plan on addressing that aspect through the aspect of education and the reform? How do you plan on mixing those both? Um, and also, how do you plan on to, like, I guess, enforce and monitor the fact that there, you said it, that there are, I guess, private ways of how, I guess, prosecutors do things behind closed doors. How does this reform plan on addressing and monitoring so that um, prosecutors don't get to use their own way or at least go around the reform that is in place or that would be in place? And two, um, how does it plan on addressing those who are already incarcerated? Um, and what would that do for them if you guys are planning to lower um, misdemeanors to, fe I mean, felonies to misdemeanors, what happens with those individuals when they get out and what kind of process would they have to go through and how would that process be well known to those individuals so they can have their felony reduced to a misdemeanor? I just, I'll just briefly address the education issue just real quickly and everybody else can join in on everything else. Uh, Missouri has a lot of work to do on education reform and uh, there are a lot of states that have done a lot more than we have to provide more options for kids um, and not uh, have your fate determined or your education outcome by the zip code that you live in. And I think that's part of it. I mean, I think all of this is really about how do we provide as much opportunity for as many people as possible. Um, and we can't overlook, and I know that's not what this forum is about, but you mentioned it, and I think it's a good point, is education. And, and um, particularly in a lot of school districts in, in North St. Louis County, for example, we've worked on some legislation that was vetoed but provided more options. And I also think the way we rethink um, education, um, you know, in its entirety. We still have a school year based on the agrarian calendar, even in urban districts where there's not a lot of planting and harvesting, okay? I mean, that's just not, and there are empirical studies that show that in, particularly in at-risk communities, when a child can go to school year-round, um, there's less, that, that loss of learning that happens in the summer months because there's not as much maybe family support or a library program that's being participated in. That, that relearning that has to happen at the beginning of a school year, kids can make up a significant amount of time in a year-round year setting. And that's just one option. So I just think providing more educational options in Missouri is something that we haven't done very well in understanding that there's a difference between St. Louis Metro and um, Knobnoster in the way that we want to provide flexibility for schools. I would agree with that. I, something else I would recommend if you haven't had a chance to read, the Department of Justice had, in addition to Ferguson, it came out around the same time, they did a huge report on the juvenile justice system of St. Louis County. And it really applies to all of the juvenile courts of the state of Missouri in terms of how do the juvenile courts work. And that the Missouri juvenile justice system had a set of points. And every time you got a point for something, it increased your risk factor. And so every time you'd have a contact with a law enforcement officer or some other risk factor, some things beyond uh, children's control, it just increased the likelihood that someone would say, oh, they need to go under court supervision. And uh, the Department of Justice came in and said that our system was greatly flawed. And there have been some reform efforts. I think there needs to be more on the juvenile justice system side. But I would, anyone who's interested in that, uh, that question should really read the Department of Justice report because it, it really would apply to any county uh, juvenile office in the state of Missouri. I think school choice would be huge. Um, to have kids to have choices to go to schools that maybe don't have school resource officers um, to disrupt the pipeline. Um, a lot of the Safe Schools Act uh, was passed in the wake of Columbine, which requires uh, that schools involve law enforcement for a lot of different things. In Georgia, one reform that they recently enacted was uh, reforming those, uh, their governor deal, Republican governor calls them the school disruption statutes. Uh, they looked at reforming those. That's something that we could look at, too. And then the one study that re recommends reducing sentences minimum and maximum also recommends applying them all retroactively across the board, which could help people that are already serving prison time. Let me, uh, one of the questions you had was, how do we monitor prosecutors? Uh, they have a great deal of uh, discretion, as you talked about earlier. Is there a way to, to uh, well, if we had less, I think, I think there's less disparity when it comes to violent crime in terms of like arresting people. Like if you, everybody agrees murder's bad or like assault is bad. So um, like less criminalization of 
what was it called, Barry? The, the Latin term? Well, I don't know. When we were in the criminal code, the things that are just bad because the government says they're bad. Malapro, yeah, less of those would probably help. I think uh, when we did the criminal code committee, Jennifer and I were on together, we joked and we said we could just do it with the entire criminal code and have stupid and mean and misdemeanor stupid and, and felony stupid <laughs> and felony mean and misdemeanor mean. And I, and I think the question is, are some of these offenses just um, offenses that are there to punish people that really are just having a hard time getting their life together, the license plate violations, the things like that? Um, those, that is really a, a question when you ask yourself about a crime. And I would say when it comes to prosecutors, um, a lot of jurisdictions publish what the prosecutor does in court in the local paper. I think you don't see it as often in the big jurisdictions. Every small county paper I pick up in a small town tells me what happened in the circuit court and what the prosecutor did. And so it's, in that sense, it's very transparent. Well, but we what, could ask for more transparency from them as their policies. And well, I think when you, you see it when they go to court, I think what you're talking about more is the decisions that are made before they go to court. Uh, but what actually happens in court is, I think, very transparent. Yeah, and what you can do is you can affect the amount of leverage they have. Right? So when you talk about things like mandatory minimums, let's suppose you're arrested and you're sitting in county jail, and not only and you can't get out because you can't afford bail, it's going to make a big difference in terms of the leverage and the bargaining power between you and a prosecutor, if you're looking at maybe five years versus 25 years. So some of these inflexible sentencing gives a lot of additional leverage and bargaining power to prosecutors. And just by changing the way that's done, that can kind of rebalance things a bit. Yeah, and the vagueness of laws, I joke that you could get charged with a felony of forgery for wearing a push-up bra in Missouri, because that's how vague that statute is. And uh, the prosecutors go back asking for vaguer and vaguer laws so we can catch them all. We can't let anyone get away, but it results in like, them just having such power over people's lives that they can exercise that it's really pretty scary. We've got time for one more question before we break. Hi, I'm Courtney Lauer, and I'm currently an attorney at the Missouri Attorney General's Office. And during law school, one of my favorite projects was actually as part of the criminal prosecution clinic where I compared not only Missouri's Department of Corrections, but also just DOCs across the country to some of the European countries like Norway and Sweden. And I mean, it really was eye-opening how different the two systems are. What are some different things that maybe we could implement here in the States that these other countries do that helps that recidivism rate, but also not be a complete shock to the current system we have? Well, I think it's Indiana or Ohio is uh, giving prisoners tablets for education in prison. I think that's a creative thing that we could look at. And I would say there's also, I visited a nonprofit um, a couple of weeks ago that uh, has a pretty intensive uh, program um, in St. Louis where they start working um, with inmates before they get out. And they have, there's buy-in, there's a lot of time spent by the inmate. And then when they come out, it's pretty um, intense also. So you get the buy-in, it's mental health services, there's things like you got to show up on time, there's just some basic life skills. And I think, you know, there's some of those nonprofits in this one in particular, they're kind of testing what's really working. And so I think empowering some other organizations outside of even government to say, here's what might work. And then that could also, you know, states could start contracting with some nonprofits too. Yeah, the other thing is, sometimes in these debates over criminal justice reform, it almost makes it sound like the police are the bad guys. And absolutely, there are t things that need to be fixed, for sure. But actually, if you look at international comparisons, we have far more correction officers per person than international other countries. But we actually have fewer police. Police are actually quite effective. If you want to reduce crime, shift resources from incarceration towards police and good police practices. Uh, and in fact, I mentioned one of the trends is that crime has fallen in the US over the past 30 years. Well, it's also fallen in Canada. One big difference, though, is we've had the big boom in incarceration, and they have not. So that's one thing we can do is just really shift things away from just the kind of incarceration stage towards uh, the policing. Well, uh, join me, please, in thanking our members of the panel. For their time tonight.